All right, welcome back from this delicious coffee break. And thanks to Welcome Bets for sponsoring this amazing saxophone battle. Uh, wow, thanks, Welcome Bets. And thank you to Norbert and Tony. Big applause again, please. These guys rock. Huh? <clears throat> okay, let's move on to our next round table. Uh, this round table is sponsored by TBO.com. Huge thank you to TBO.com for sponsoring this great round table. And it's about um, the, upcoming, the upcoming investment trends. So it's about the people who have the money. Uh, what are they looking at? What are investment funds actually interested in? And uh, where are the opportunities they're seeing? This round table is going to be presented and moderated by Alex Gispert. Alex is a well-known industry man and a good old friend. He's also the CEO and co-founder at Fast Pay Hotel. So please join me in welcoming Alex and the, the participants. One more time, Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, TBO, Gaurav. Uh, thank you so far for a great day, uh, Travelgate team. I think we've also learned a lot. Most importantly, that Pedro takes the really big decisions like what music they listen to in the office. So um, I think that's, uh, that's so far a great day. We're going to keep the energy levels nice and high, um, and we're going to get an awful lot packed in, hopefully, uh, into the next 35 minutes or so. Um, Fast Pay Hotels was founded nearly eight years ago, um, when we, and about four years ago, uh, we went through the pain, the suffering of raising a funding round um, and getting private equity investment. Um, I personally pitched 42 different funds around Europe um, to take um, Fast Pay Hotels to the next level and move, and move into, into that funding round. And I can tell you it was one of the most uh, brutal uh, uncomfortable, uh, tiring um, processes uh, that, that we've ever been through. Um, at some point, Fast Pay Hotels, because it's private equity backed, will have to exit, will have to, will have to sell, uh, something will happen to it. And I know now that I never want to do that process again without the help of some of the experts that we have here with us today. Um, so what I'm going to try and get, do, get out of this session, certainly, is um, run through uh, some of the trends, but make sure that some of you guys in the crowd understand a little bit what's happening in the M&A space, in the investment space. Um, so let's go straight to it. We really have three of the leading lights uh, in our industry and when it comes to M&A investments venture. I'm extremely proud and thankful to you, the three of you, for answering the call uh, and, and coming all this way. Um, but let's start with, with, with introductions. Uh, Jan, um, why don't you start with telling us a little bit about you and your business and we'll go from there. Try to be quick. So I, I signed up as a journalist this morning because investment bank is not possible uh, for this <laughs> conference. And that's, uh, I still don't quite feel like an investment banker either. So quite some um, history in the space, Kayak and other brands, and then founded Enea five years ago, much younger than, than your companies are. And we try to nurture this, uh, the ecosystem a little bit in terms of masterclasses, investment, and then we do fundraising and M&A. So we're really, I think we're talking about multiple different sectors uh, this afternoon, actually. And based in? In Munich, uh, Paris, and Zurich. Morgan, good morning, everyone. So um, I'm a travel banker, so I, I do M&A in travel. I live and breathe travel, uh, tech and uh, non-tech. I've been doing this for 15 years. This uh, I co-founded Campbell Partners, which is a number one investment bank in France. and. Uh, I've done 60 deals in the travel tech space over the last 10 years, so uh, I hope to do 10 times more in the next 10 years, so uh, that's, that's my passion. I live in Madrid, and I work in Paris and London. Uh, thanks, Alex. Good morning. Uh, Henry Wells. Um, I'm delighted that Connex have introduced everyone to my middle name, uh, which I don't use. I'm not an American, but it is Henry Wells. Um, I've been an M&A advisor for 25 years. Um, what does advisor mean? You know, I haven't got money, what we've got is advice. So we're helping businesses sell, businesses buy, raise money, um, or decide what they do next. We are talking to, to C-suites, this is people like you, and, and trying to position yourselves for what you want to do next. The business I work for now is all about growth companies. Um, so to put myself in, in context for this audience, businesses that I advise in this space, which are a matter of public record, are the likes of Jack Travel, Low Cost Holidays, On the Beach, Travel Republic, E-Travel I. It's that sort of universe. Um, 
You asked me to... to uh, I'm a father of three teenagers, so actually what I really am is an unpaid Uber driver. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm also a, a keen golfer uh, and a lover of cricket. I live and work in London, but our business is, is European. Very good. So hopefully you guys have got a measure of, 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 of the three experts that we have here today. So, so guys, let's go, um, Jan, through, through to Henry. Um, is this a busy time? Are we seeing a lot of M&A deals? Should we be expecting the crowd, the crowd here? Should we be all of you expecting um, lots of big announcements over the course of the next uh, 12, 18 months? Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I would say it's busy, but it's not necessarily easy, right? I mean, we heard about the macro trends uh, today. I would differentiate between the investment side of things where um, we hear a lot also from the U.S. It is difficult right now. People people looking into into the next few years and, and not quite quite sure uh, especially next year but then also beyond uh, in MA, there's always a lot of work to do of course so so that's a different game with private equities i think um, we don't see as much strategic activity at this point in time uh, as we may have seen uh, pre-covid obviously but in terms of private equities there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of deals and platforms to be built Morgan? i, I think MA was always part of uh, the uh, the history of travel, you know, large companies uh, got created through mostly uh, through M&A. So you've uh, all, we all have in mind, you know, large transactions in that space. So are we going to see very large transactions in the coming 12 months? Okay. Not sure. It can, it can come back. But I think, you know, M&A will still be very active. I am myself very active in that space. But on, only for, uh, I'm very selective, meaning uh, not only, not everyone can, can pretend get sold or acquire another company. So you need... Uh, you need the bar is quite high. You need to have growth, uh, organic growth, nice profits, and M&A activity as well. So I, I'm very bullish on the space for I don't know for the next 10 years I would say. But you know at least we have to be super selective in the way that we handle our business. And, and clearly you can't reveal any names, Morgan. But from the deals that you're working on now, what kind of deals are you seeing? Are you seeing big buying small? Are you seeing consolidation? What kind of deals are you seeing? Yeah, we have. Uh, you know I think this industry is uh, characterized by hyper-fragmentation and hyper-local businesses. So you need to put all those small businesses together to form bigger bigger businesses that eventually got sold and acquired by larger companies. So we're doing the job of combining small local businesses, putting together to reach mid-size, mid-scale companies that eventually got acquired by, by large, uh, larger ones. Because this is, the, this is the, the, the history of travel. There will always be M&A in that space. So I can't reveal names, but I think, you know, um, any company with uh, a few, a few, uh, you know, hundred thousand or million EBITDA uh, can claim acquire another one or being acquired, and then uh, you have to be aware that don't expect a big company to acquire your small company. You know, do the job by combining with other businesses. You will increase your chance to get to get, to get acquired one day, uh, because size really is a matter in that space. Very good, Henry. Are you busy? Uh, it's, I, I think I'd characterise it as busy but hard. Uh, I don't think it's ever been harder to do a deal. Um, and that is because of a number of, of macro factors. Um, but as I say to my team and to my children, um, if it was easy, anyone could do it. So it's, it's about finding the right client and managing them properly. I mean, Morgan is absolutely right um, that we have to be selective because the only thing we have is our time. Uh, and so we have to pick people and deals that we think will be successful. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and we've got processes that we go through to look at that. Because if we think that the deal in its form won't be successful, we won't do it. So let's work out what's successful and then let's go really hard and make it work. And would you agree with Morgan, that, um, this, this idea of small businesses combining to become something more attractive? Are you seeing some of that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that that's always the case, but at many different layers. I mean, we, we, where I sit in the eco world, we are advising businesses um, that are fundraising sort of up to 10 or 20 million pounds, or US dollars, let's talk in this room, same as the euro. Um, and, and then we're doing deals of, of businesses that are sort of up to 50 million in, in EBITDA. So we're not in the mega space, but there is a lot going on in that space, and there is consolidation across a, a number of verticals. Um, so, so in terms of um, in, in terms of the deals that you dedicate your time to, Henry, um, you've talked about your, what is precious to you. Yep. Um, what are you attracted to in terms of deals? And actually, more specifically, what are you saying, not interested, it's not worth spending my time on? 
Yeah, um, I knew you were going to ask this question because you told me. Um, so I have thought about it, um, and <laughs> I, I've got a notebook here. So I was born in the in the very early 70s, and these guys have all got. Oh, you got a notebook too. Um, so w when we look at a business, especially in, in the more technology space, we will look at inputs and outputs. Um, and in a financial world, input uh, outputs are important. So, so so what are what are investors looking at? They're looking at ARR growth, NRR, percentage of uh, subscription, gross margin, rule of 40, LTV CAC, customer value, length of contracts, market size. So, and I've got a matrix that does that, and you chuck it all in. But that's a sort of the AI world of advisory, which I don't particularly subscribe to. Um, and the reason I don't subscribe to that is because AI is good at routine. And of the 100 or so deals I've done in the last 25 years, not one has been the same as the other, which is the beauty of what we do. And so we're very privileged to, to do that. The inputs, the most important things, are management, passion, and drive. And you'll all sit in this room and say, I'm a CEO, I've got a great team, I'm the best. Um, we've got lots of passion and lots of drive. Well, prove it to me, prove it to yourself. Um, we'll look at those inputs, and if they're not delivering the outputs, the investors aren't going to look at it. So we need to help you work that out or tell you what will work. Um, and I think the key to our role is to tell you what we think is possible, not what you think you want to hear. And, you know, that's one of my business mantras is to do exactly that. What about you, Jan? You've got a busy little schedule. What will, you, what, will you, what will you go for? What are you attracted in? What do you walk away from? Without that notebook, I, I cannot enumerate as many things. But I think what's, what's really important is the coherence of those factors that you just mentioned. Uh, so a lot of times you would see, you see uh, growth curves that don't really match what investors want to see in here. You also have to add to that that we need to have a feeling for we we know we we know at least a pattern of buyers or investors that would really want to do this. Otherwise, we shouldn't take a deal, right? So th that that's an initial um, hypothesis. And sometimes, of course, we also get it wrong. So you're, you're you're trying to tap into one universe of investors, which might be those looking for growth, and and you end up with PEs, and they look at what you're presenting, and they don't really like it. So it's really important also for for any startup, for any, uh, for, for any mature company as well, to understand who are you even talking to? What asset class are you in for them? I think that's a very important one. What would you walk away from, Jan? What would you walk away from? When, when you get the knock on the door from DMCs, uh, bed banks, uh, mapping companies, uh, connectivity businesses, do you turn around and go, ah, it's had its day? No, no, it's, it's all about the factors that Henry effectively mentioned. Uh, what we would walk away from certainly is um, cap tables that don't really work out. So you, you often a, a deal might fail uh, because the cap table, the investors that are in there don't don't really match and, and have different uh, interests. I think uh, not to underestimate is accounting. If you do not have your the metrics right um, in terms of in terms of what an investor wants to see, in, especially in private equity, we see that a lot. Um, you will fail actually just because of that. That's a very important element. Morgan, what are you attracted to? What turns you off? I, you know, I think there are great businesses everywhere. You know, even B two C businesses can be great. And I think I, I hear a lot of people walking away from B two C because it's a, a, a meant to be a cash burning business. You never got. Uh, I think you know there. You should not make a general statement. There are always great businesses everywhere. So you should be. You know, I don't. I don't have a, a general rule. I am more attracted these days by software slash tech businesses that can serve. Decent organic growth and are able to do M&A delivering, I'd say, you know, decent organic growth. That what it means? It means 15, 20 percent minimum organic growth. You should be able to serve that on a long term basis. Uh, you should be able to identify, ideally acquire businesses, uh, show your ability to acquire businesses. And then eventually uh, you should be able to deliver 25 to 35 percent of EBITDA. That's what I look l uh, as as a, as a uh, you know potential uh, advisor, and when the when the window is right, uh, when those metrics are met, there's a good chance for you to transact. Should you have reasonable expectations in mind? And to the question, what I walk away from in general, I walk walk away from people that have valuations in mind that are not related to you know what the market is able to serve. And I I am super mindful, as Henry said, we ha only have our time. This is our only asset. So my assets, I try to spend it in people who are, who are, you know, foot on the ground, you know, aware of where the valuations are. And we can say that valuations in 2023 are not where they were in 2019 or even in 2020. So you have to be mindful.
Sorry? They're lower? A lot, they are lower. So I'd say a lot, I wouldn't say that because you can see company transacting at 20 times EBITDA, uh, but you know, it's only for companies delivering 40, 50% EBITDA margin. And Henry mentioned the rule of 40, which is now rule of 60 rather in the soft, uh, software and SaaS space. So if you are in that bucket, then all the buyers or uh, private equity of, this, of the universe will want to invest in your company. That will create inflation. You will benefit from that. But it's only, we're only talking about a handful of companies, while the rest is more like you know, 8 to 12 times EBITDA. We're back to normal. That's very healthy. I feel much more comfortable these days than I was in 2019. And you mentioned B2C businesses, and, um, and probably a question I hadn't put to you but occurred to me now is, um, how much of a shadow does Booking.com or Expedia's growth and size cast over how investors and um, um, buyers take over, over the kind of business that you, that, that you pay? Because obviously, you know, I'm an OTA, I sell hotels in New York, and I think I've got a great business. It, you know, there's obviously a big shadow from, the, from so these big two, both in B2B and B2C space. Of course, yeah, there's uh, always the elephant in the room, so, and they will not acquire every business in the world. So they will, they will probably grow on your back, be against you, be in front of you. Uh, there are some niches, and uh, this is why I'm trying to, I, I, you know, to identify the, the key niches where Booking, Expedia won't go, or Airbnb won't go, because it's too complex. Maybe it's a geography. Maybe it's a market segment. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a target price. You know, I've raised a lot of money for a company called Le Collectionist. Le Collectionist is a luxury Airbnb. Air Airbnb tried, failed. Does it mean that it's a bad business? No, it just was wrongly executed by Airbnb. For now, they will correct that one day. And, but for now, there's a space left empty by the large players in luxury vacation rental. That's one example. Henry Yen, I don't know if you want to make a mention on, yeah, on the no, shadow. I, I, was just, uh, I, I was just thinking, and, and I can talk about this deal because it's one that we've just done and it is a matter of public record, and Jan actually was smart enough to invest in it. There's a business called SeatFrog, which is based in the UK, SeatFrog, uh, SeatFrog.com, which is based in the UK. Um, and you know, we've raised, uh, we raised uh, £6 million for them just recently. Um, and look, it was a super business, and it solved a problem that needed solving. So that's sort of question one, because you can go to a, a number of startup events and someone from uh, somewhere really smart with lots of uh, IQ has developed something to solve a problem that doesn't actually need solving. And so, you know, when you ask about, do you walk away from stuff? Yeah, because actually if that problem doesn't need solving, then why are we here? Um, but, you know, Ian, Ian and Dirk did a fantastic job, but they had to present hard, we had to work hard. Um, and we've got some really great investors. Um, I mean, yeah, and you're still involved, so super business, and I think that's going to go great places. Very good. But just to add, I mean, the shadow is also on the niches, right? So because you're talking to those, um, especially when you're, talk when you're in the VC game, right? You're talking to investment managers, and the first question they will ask, um, Halal Booking is another example in the UK where we believe we have a very strong asset there. Booking is not going to copy it. They're not a good, as good as the UX. They're not as good at data in that specific sector. And yet, in every conversation, you have to deal with that. Yeah. Because effectively, you're dealing with fresh investment managers. Um, then you're dealing with funds. And you have to find the ones that you can really convince to invest um, because they know that it's going to grow. Very good. We've got um, in the room today uh, a series of C-level executives, CFOs, founders, CEOs, et cetera, et cetera, who will no doubt be walking away from listening to the three of you and saying, I should talk to these guys and start thinking about selling my business, right? And I think you said some key things, get your accounts in order, have, a res have an answer to the question, how will Booking and Expedia uh, react? Um, talk about that. But let's talk about metrics and valuation, because obviously, you're right, founders, uh, I included, we all have a great vision of our own businesses and think they're the best businesses in the world and the best teams, and, and, and Henry, I think you're totally right. Um, certainly pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, um, what are the KPI? If you were sat here today and you were planning for, in the next 18 months, two years, a, a, a sale, a, some kind of M&A activity, what are the metrics now, right? We, certainly on the other side of the pandemic, we saw the WeWorks and the Twitters and the Facebooks and uh, revenues. We, 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 we've obviously got this massive, we've heard a lot this morning about AI. We've talked an awful lot about uh, you know, the need for innovation. We've talked about people being efficient, low cost. Uh, we've, we, you know, if you were now advising a CEO here preparing for some kind of uh, M&A activity over the course of the next 18 months, two years, 
what were the metrics that you'd be saying, start working on this? Um, you know, is it, a rev is it evaluations on revenue? Are they, you know, if you don't have AI, don't come, don't come knocking on my door anytime soon. W where are you with that? What advice would you give to the, to the people in the room? I, I think I'd start by taking a step back and, and, and remind people. I know it's, it's very obvious, but some people forget it. Evaluation is only what someone's prepared to pay for it on the day. And that's the day where you complete or you get the investment. Um, and that is a long journey. It takes time. Uh, and you need to work out why you're good and why you're going to justify and how you're going to look better or worse than somebody else. Now, in terms of the metrics, I'll let these guys talk, but like that, that metrics table I went through, they're all important. Uh, and, and certainly in this space, the, the rule of 40, which actually I, we'd seen move to the rule of 50, um, and, and used to the rule of 60, is looking at the, the net of growth rate and, and EBITDA margin. So if you're growing at 50%, but you're losing 10% at EBITDA, that's 40. So 12 months ago, you were in a good place. I think now, less good. Yeah, to totally. I think, you know, one thing maybe to, uh, it's, I think no one should be obsessed by selling its business. Like, you know, it should, should come ideally naturally. And it's a very long-term process. Although we may be appointed for a few months, like the six to nine months, this is generally what a process, how long a process takes. But it's, you know, it requires preparation long ahead of a, a potential process. So it means that you get to know your partners, you need to get, you know, your acquirers, you need to establish partnerships, establish relationships. So for, for me, you know, I, I try to minimize the difficulty of my task. Not that I'm lazy, but, you know, <laughs> uh, I have only 24 hours in a day and <laughs> less, less a, a bit of less a sleep. But anyway, I think the, 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 you know, the best exits come from the best preparation. And us as advisors can only impact six to nine months of that journey. So I'd say you know, get to understand your, your ecosystem very well, identify your buyers, and then there's, there's gonna be a good moment. On the metrics, as I mentioned, you, the combination of growth and EBITDA is a must have right now to hope for a great exit. So, and I would say negative EBITDA is a, str is a strong headwind these days. So you do, probably don't want a good market with a negative EBITDA. That's how the market is right now. We're not, you know, setting the rules. We're just, you know, remarking the rules. So I think it's, it's important to, to combine solid organic growth. Yeah, stay focused. If you have to retain one word, growth, but not to be had the deterrent of, of profit. So try to combine the two with, with at a minimum of a, of a bit of profit. I think that's, a, that's one of the key learning of the, of the period. So that's gonna be probably for the next six, 12 months, the stage of that market. But I think it's healthy. It's a healthy way of, of thinking about valuation. And sorry, and the EBITDA multiples that you think are reasonable in the current market. What 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 are you what are you saying? Tough question, but uh, you know it depends on the market and the competitive tension. So people like us can bring competition to your process. This is great to push uh, multiples upwards. Uh, but let's say don't go to market thinking that everyone is going to pay is going to be paying 15 times your EBITDA. Right? That's that's uh, that's a nonsense. So I'd say the market is probably. It's, you'd say the mainstream 12 to 10, 10 you know 12 to uh, 10 to 12 times you know current year EBITDA that's a good basis so if you're not happy with the valuation don't go to market wait another year very good yeah yeah I, I tend to send very long decks to Morgan and then he <laughs> tells me just give me that I only that one watch the last page <laughs> no no it's wrong um, but m maybe just to add to that two things I think one I mean rule of 30, 40, 50, if I'm on the sales side, of course, I'm saying, well, you never make your plan just on, the, the don't get frightened by it now if you're, you know, if, if you're at 30 in, in that sense, 15% growth, 15% um, EBITDA, uh, and, and, and think that you cannot sell the company or 20, but it's, it's much harder. The multiple correlates. Why? Because, of course, you're, whoever buys it wants to earn that money back quite simply, over the years, and that's the, the function of the multiple. Maybe to add one thing, uh, with generic funds in particular, they don't like travel, um, I'm talking about B2B now, uh, often for one, reasons because they, for one reason, because they don't really see it as proper SaaS business in a lot of cases. So the development of a lot of the business models in this room, I'm sure as well, away from implementation and, and other type of fee structures to a very s simplistic, almost SaaS fee structure is what uh, generalist um, investors usually like because they can compare it with other industries. Yeah, but don't, l don't let them tell you what to do. You know, I think transaction-based revenue is the best business model in the world. 
So, and people may say, hey, it's not rec recurring. But, but, but you call that SaaS, right? So that, that's, that's how we classify it. I think, you know, if you are a traditional subscription business, you may say, okay, I'm, you know, I have a very stable uh, prediction of my cash flows and my, uh, of my revenue, up to the point that people consider it's, uh, they're, they're not getting the value in front of that. While if you're a transaction-based business, then you earn money when the, the business is good. You earn less money when the business is bad. That's why I think the, 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 the world of tech providers in, the, in, the, in travel tech you know, went through pretty well through the, the pandemic because it was a transaction base. So the cost of you know, delivering that service was, was lowered a lot. So I think that's the best business model in the world. I keep, I keep uh, trying to uh, convince investors that yeah. they, don't, <laughs> they should not try to influence yeah. you on going yeah. to a okay. pure subscription or a recurring business. But, so, so I think if, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to add, add to that briefly. Is, is when you look at investors, you've got, you know, have a financial investor or a, a financial buyer, and you may have a trade buyer. Um, and I think that what COVID has done to valuations is introduce the concept of COVID. And, you know, travel has forever been uh, going through difficult patches. There might be, you know, bird flu, there's terrorist attacks, there's volcanoes. But never before, or not since 1919, um, has there been such a pandemic. So I think when you are an investor, you are now looking at life through a lens of when or if it, there is another one. And it could be 2026, it could be 2036, or hopefully... 21-19. But that, I think, has had an impact and it's going to take a bit of time to come out of that. Yeah, but there's a, if I may add something, which is now post-COVID, when there is a, a, a COVID happening, there's a rebound. Yep. And that rebound is very strong. So we all know that uh, you know, travel is almost a primary need for, for humanity. So, and it's, it can be a force for good. I am convinced it's a force for good. So uh, you, you may have you know, 12 months, 18 months maximum of slow down of your business and it will come back. So you, you should be prepared to have like 12, 18 months of treasury in order to support the, the, that period, but it will stop. Uh, AI has been mentioned a lot this morning. Um, and, and how relevant is that to valuations uh, from what the conversations you're having? Does, 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 do investors get more excited about AI, metaverse, et cetera, et cetera? Um, it's Silicon Valley, it's a checkbox. Are you going to be disrupted by, uh, for, for venture, I'm talking venture capital now. Yeah. It's a checkbox. Are you going to be disrupted by this? Are you, are, you deal, uh, are you handling it well? Are you, are you, you know, what's your concept around it? Uh, that's, that's what we hear. I think it's a bit different in the M&A space, right? I think, yeah, you know, we're not still at the stage where, you know, AI brings a premium to your, your, the valuation of your company. At least I haven't seen it. Uh, so, but AI is going to be a commodity soon, meaning you, you need to work with AI tools that to automate some of the tasks you could, you could you know, better deliver through uh, AI than a human. So, but I think there will still be, uh, there's still, you know, room for humanity in that space. So, uh, a service handled by a human person with a good advice, a good destination, and a good customer service. I think, you know, probably COVID replaced the humanity at the right, the and the human at the right place. Very good. I don't know if you have a view on AI. I, I, I agree. I think may, 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 uh, w w with what Morgan has said, uh, what, what I would also say is it is, it is going to be a huge change. But let's not forget that when I started advising businesses in 2005, Google was five years old. I I'm not sure Facebook had been invented and TikTok was minus 10. And now look at them. So w we have to take life in context. Uh, and look, it, it is going to be enormous. But I agree, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a commodity. Thank you. So, um, building up to today, I had lots of people give me feedback and say, I want to know what they think about this and what they think about that. So, we're going to try and rush this um, in, 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 in record time. So, I, I'm going to throw out some words, uh, uh, each of you indiscriminately. Um, if I could get the one two-word answer, uh, two-word opinion almost, uh, if you can shout them down, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in a kind of fun way, it'd be quite good to understand your view of how you see the industry. Uh, you speak to so many people, it'll be interesting to see how, how that goes. So, um, uh, You promise not to ask me a word I don't understand. That's very good, <laughs> very good. We'll start with you, Morgan. Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> no, the, um, let's start with super apps. Henry, how do you see uh, super apps? Not sure. Morgan? Very expensive. <laughs> Relevant in a lot of geographies. Um, bed banks, yeah. 
will will stay and will um, probably um, be sitting on blockchain on one at one point. Long term, critical to the ecosystem, but they need to and uh, continue to evolve. Very good. Blockchain. Oh, it's beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> We're on it. Yeah, I just mentioned. I think a lot of a lot of the economy is going to run on blockchain. The relevance of metaverse. Hopefully not, um, not, 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 uh, not by Facebook. What relevance? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I'd Facebook say hopefully not strong. too relevant. No. I'd say not Does it have a role it's, in our future? Alta Vista. Metaverse? Not in mine. No. <laughs> uh, I'm very proud of the 75 countries I've visited on this earth. Uh, I love this world. I think I'll stick in it. <laughs> mm. Your view of the traditional tour operators, Morgan? It's still good businesses. You know, good brands, good businesses need to evolve preparing for transition, but still good businesses because have good customers. Yeah. There are disruptors in this room who hopefully will do a good job. Yeah, they're a threat, yeah. Yeah. Henry? Yeah, uh, really important, um, but they, they have to move fast to stay ahead of the disruptors in this room. Any view on the upcoming Digital Market Act? Yeah? Too little, too late. Um, I think it's going to... I, I, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical when it comes to uh, when it comes to how we handle tech and how we, you know, we, we're talking about 10 years of development um, in the next 10 years being more than the last 100 years. Now we look 100 years back, we talk about 1% impact on the travel industry. That math for me doesn't stack up. So we we have to speed up. Fair. Yeah, but I think uh, you know, I'm still uh, I still place my hope in uh, in private private policies, private companies. So I don't think we, we can be helped in any shape or form by, by you know, external policies. Yeah, I think legislative framework is important, but it's usually too slow and too late. So again, it comes back to the private companies doing the right things. Um, Jan, let's go with vacation rental. Growing, um, still to be consolidated, I think, and, and still in to, to, to mature in order, uh, in terms of payment, in terms of a lot of, uh, you know, Consolidation on the back end, but very relevant, of course. Okay. Super hot. Sorry to be uh, missing the party tonight, guys. I'm heading to Malaga for another summit on vacation rental, but uh, certainly very hot. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Um, and then uh, Google. Henry. <laughs> Someone asked me this question when I sat on a panel in 2006. Um, <laughs> when are Google coming into travel? To which I said, never. They don't want to issue a ticket. They don't want to check you in. I have not changed my view. They're already in travel. I use, uh, I don't know what you use. Um, I, sorry, Jan, for you, but I'm, I don't use Sky. I use Google Flights. So they're already, for me, a, a very good information provider. So they are making more money than everyone else in travel. So it will continue to be like that. AI is going to be interesting in terms of how it's consolidating the entry point to the market. And I'm not sure it's going to be necessarily the, the, the big OTAs who succeed, but it could be the direct, uh, you know, the, the supplier. Last two. Um, sustainability? Yeah. Not enough of an issue in the investment industry. Yeah, same. Um, we want more and faster. It's a need. Uh, if, we, if travel wants to remain a force for good, it has to transition faster. Uh, it's a need that needs to be genuine. I mean, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Very good. And finally, uh, Connex. Awesome. Looking forward to After X as well. <laughs> Very good. Morgan? <laughs> I to a Connex to 24, hopefully. Very good. And yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Very good. Thank you, guys. We. We, we do have some questions. Am I allowed to do questions? I'm allowed to do two questions. So um, the let's go with this one. Um, how can investors and companies ensure successful integration following a merger or acquisition? Henry, do you want to work it out before you buy it? <laughs> yeah, and don't don't be too uh, in a rush for tech integration. Yeah. Tech integration can be a nightmare. So talk to each other, Zoom helps, and maybe try to get some of the old investors out in the deal. And then question one, sort of kind of similar, I think you've covered that. And which, uh, let's go, um, Jan, which strategy are you following nowadays, small caps versus large caps? I think we talked about it, the, the bigger the better, right? Yeah. 
I think, you know, uh, we are doing our business in small caps and mid caps, but we're definitely looking at that space to sell to large caps. Very good. Henry? Yeah, uh, we're, uh, we're in the small and mid cap space, definitely. Guys, thank you so much. Fantastic content. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.